Coming up this week on Success Won't Come Calling. Your staff should want to come into work. Without them, you're nothing. Let's let's remember that. If I if my staff don't want to come into work for me, I'm on my own trying to do it all. I want to create an environment where people feel happy. Hello, hello, friends. Welcome to the podcast. Simon Gibson here. It's SWCC. If you're watching us on YouTube, please just take a moment to subscribe. That would be very much appreciated. And what is also very much appreciated is the attendance of my guest, Dave Critchley. How are you, sir? I'm very good. Good, yeah. How are you? I'm very good indeed. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it, man. Well, that's all right. It's brilliant. Yeah. And Looking we do. To it. And we do. We do guest rider on the podcast. And this is the first occasion when the guest has actually brought their own drink with them. Not just that you own, but that you you've branded it's your gin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know how that was going to come across. Then I was the first guy to bring his own booze. <laughs> <laughs> Typical chef. Now, um, yeah. So this is. I mean, you, you'll be the, one of the first to ever try this. So uh, yeah, there you go. So to, give exclusive. Us, give Give us the background. Then where, where's it come from? Okay. So Tian Jin was the first gin that we released, and that was uh, last year. And that's working in partnership with the. Gin Smiths of Liverpool, literally around the corner, Love Lane, based there, aren't they? Uh, uh, great guys they are. And they created our Chinese-inspired gin, uh, which had kind of flavours of angelica and jasmine and pear and stuff like that. And then this is the new one. This is our pink gin now. So this is a cherry blossom flavour of the same kind of base flavours of gin. So we're quite excited about this one. Well, it's it's really tasty. And I, So that hasn't got jasmine in it, because I thought it could taste a bit yeah. of that. No, so that's still the same flavours that we used for our previous gin, and now we've added in a cherry blossom flavour for this one. And uh, yeah, I love it. And is it is it available for, for to, to be purchased now? It will be. By the time, uh, maybe by the time, by the time this, comes, this out. comes out, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're just finalising, uh, finalising everything, getting the branding done, and um, yeah, it'll be out and available to buy. Lovely. Well, we're going to make sure on our socials, guys. There's there's links to that, and having just had a sip of it, it's it's really really good stuff. So, um, absolutely delighted you, that you came on. First of all, let's just do where you are where you are now. Obviously, you you've worked, you've you've led some of the best restaurants in the northwest, and. I've been to a number of them, but most recently I went to your current restaurant, which you lead, which is Lou Ban yeah. here in Liverpool. First of all, I've, I've got to say, guys, I would wholeheartedly recommend this restaurant. I went there with my missus and, and my kids. It's it's a Chinese restaurant, but it's fine dining. The food was absolutely superb. I could not recommend it high and highly enough. But there was a couple of points I just wanted to cover off, Dave, because yeah. as well as the quality of the food, there were two things that jumped out at me. The first was the team. Yeah, the service. I felt it was quite a different experience in that all of the team seemed relaxed. Yeah. They seemed busy, but not rushed. Yeah. They all seemed to like each other, which came across to me, even just from eating in there. And then the second thing was it's a very well-directed restaurant, even from when you walk in the front door. Now, I know that that now is is your role. So I wonder, first of all, just, just the team, how important is the team in, in a restaurant like Luban or a restaurant generally? Um, it's huge. The team's everything. Without the team, there is no restaurant. There's nothing. There's no service. There's no food. You just can't do it alone. Um, so we've, we've worked really hard to build that team, and it's nice for you to say those words because it means that we're doing exactly what we set out to do. So... Yeah, we've been lucky in some regards with the team. The kitchen team is still the same team I started with November 2019, which is quite unheard of in this industry, to be honest. There's so much movement um, and, and staff, yeah, movement across the kitchen teams normally. Um, the front of house we did struggle with after COVID. We'd lost a lot of our European workers uh, and a couple of staff who just had enough of the industry after that time. Even though they enjoyed working there, they kind of saw... A new life <laughs> through lockdown. They saw, yeah, life where they didn't have to be doing those long hours and stuff like that. But uh, we still wanted to create that, yeah, real nice. It sounds a bit cliche, but it's it is a family. It is a team. They all know each other well. They all get on together. They have to. They spend a lot of time together. Um, they're spending kind of twelve hour days together as a group. So we we worked really hard on first and foremost finding the right people attitude wise. 
So we weren't necessarily looking for the best waiters out there uh, or the best bar staff. We were looking for guys with a real nice attitude, calm, relaxed, uh, good under pressure. And yeah, like I said, enjoy working in the industry and enjoy working with other people. That's that's paramount, creating that team. And um, yeah, and direction, that's that's mainly my job, like you said now. So it's like, this is the flow. If when the customer walks through the door, it's a greeting, it's a smile, it's a how are you doing? Um, nice and relaxed. We didn't want uh, too formal. We wanted people to walk in. Like you said, you came with children. I want you to come in. I've got a child myself. I don't know. I like to eat at nice restaurants. And sometimes you feel a little bit, oh, God, yeah, I hope he doesn't make too much noise. I hope he doesn't do this. I hope he doesn't do that. I don't care. If your kids want to come in and run around, they can run around. If they want to like make noise, they can make noise. I put the music on. You notice that the tunes, not not a traditional Chinese music, as it were. It's dance tunes. It's it's disco. It's do you know what I mean? Just so hopefully you can relax and sit down. And if you drop a fork, not everyone looks at you. <laughs> do you no, know what I mean? It's nothing worse. Yeah, one of them restaurants, silent restaurant. You drop a fork and everyone's staring at you, and you're like. I just dropped a fork, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That that there was two things that I, that really resonated with me there. One, you have pulled off that family feel yeah. definitely in terms of both how the staff present to you, but also the fact that the kids did feel very welcome. Yeah. But also, um, like you say, there wasn't. It, it didn't feel a formal experience at all. Yeah. Which in some respects contrasted with the quality of the food yeah. because yeah. usually when you go into a restaurant like that. With that quality of food, it does tend to be more formal. So t tell me about your role in the restaurant. Are you, are you not kind of on the tools, as it were, anymore? Sometimes. Yeah. Um, so obviously I, I, I came to the business as the um, exec head chef when we first opened, before it was even built. I was hired as the chef. It was my job to design the menus, go and do the research out in China, come back, write the menus, uh, and then lead the kitchen team. And it's kind of evolved over time where I kind of yeah, step away from the kitchen a bit more and work on the other side of the window or the pass, as we call it, um, so I can still see everything that's happening in the kitchen. I've got a head chef, Tony, who's been my rock for, for many years in various restaurants. Um, and I've also brought in uh, a good guy called Niall as well. And, and those two effectively run the kitchen with my junior sous chef, Kaylee, as well, who I've known since she was 15. Um so I've been building these guys for years um, and they effectively run the kitchen. I'm a bit like the queen now. If I go in the kitchen, I'll go in for a, yeah, to look great on the pass. <laughs> no, but I still, I still enjoy doing that. So, uh, but mainly now, yeah, my role is to ensure that the front of house and the kitchen are working as one unit. It's the same values across everywhere. So um, now I can spend my time. We've built the, the front of house team up again after COVID. And I spend a lot of time with them now explaining to them the stories from China. The kitchen team know it. They're probably bored of them now. The amount of times I tell them, this is why we do that. And this is what happened in China. And this is why we serve that on there. Um, so now the front of the house need that. They need to know. They need to buy into that, what I saw out there. It's hard for them because they haven't seen it. Well, we're going we're gonna to come to this really interesting um, diversification in your career, which happened when you first got the call from Luban. Yeah. But one of the reasons I was so keen to have you on, Dave, is you don't fit the stereotype of sort of a, a head chef, mm -hmm. psychopath in the kitchen, screaming at everyone, banging pans. You you could you're a calm guy. You, you you're very measured in the way you speak, and I, and and that, as I say, was reflective of the the experience in Luban. Yeah, I just wondered. What is more reflective of the industry? Is it a Dave Critchley or is it the nutter screaming at everyone? I think um, historically and traditionally, it's, it's your nutter, it's your psychopath. And that unfortunately still happens in a lot of restaurants up and down the country. Um, but there needs to be a change. And I'm the kind of, I'm, I'm someone who's driving the change and saying, it doesn't have to be like that. It should be calm, measured, controlled. Your staff should want to come into work. Without them, you're nothing. Let's let's remember that. If I if my staff don't want to come in to work for me, I'm on my own trying to do it all. No one wants that. Um, I want to create an environment where people feel happy. I sat actually in the restaurant last night, and I was just sat watching into the kitchen, and uh, the chefs all had smiles on their faces. It was nice, calm, relaxed. It got busier. I watched the people coming in. It was getting busier and busier and busier. 
and the temperament never changed. It just stayed exactly the same. It just, the feud started coming quicker. And I was like, that is exactly what I've been trying to train into these guys for, for so long. And they got it straight away and they buy into it and they enjoy working together. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's possibly, I probably went through that stage when I was a younger chef, immature, just trying to fit in and, and do whatever. There is the shouting, there is the screaming, but it doesn't work. Well, I was going to say, it's it comes across to me that, that, that the industry that it's implicitly stressful and pressurized anyway yeah. because you've got long hours. Yeah. You, if you're in a busy restaurant, your 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 time is of the essence. You've got demanding customers who, you know, if you get a if if you put a fork out of place, they'll rush onto social media yeah, to talk it. about Trip it. Either. So I guess the devil. <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely. I guess that you know the pressure and the stress is there. So what possible benefit can there be? in leading in anything other than a very yeah. positive way like you do. Yeah, well, exactly. If you increase the pressure, it's only going to be, it's just going to be chaos. So we have a chef's table in the kitchen. I um, don't know if we showed you that, but that's a table directly sat in the kitchen. And six guests can sit down and we do a taster menu in there and I'll be explaining the dishes and talking about my experiences in China. But the fact is, there's a table sat directly inside the kitchen. So, um, that's, that's been great for us for two reasons. A, uh, people get to see an insight into the kitchen and how a professional kitchen works. Uh, and B, the staff get used to having that kind of customer interaction because the chefs won't often be out speaking to guests. But I think it's really important that they do and, and they build those skills up as well. It's great for them to learn. Um, and it means they behave as well because <laughs> they're being watched. But um, yeah, ever since we opened, we had the chef's table in. So yeah, and every single table that sits down, like every single time, it's like, isn't it calm in here? Isn't it peaceful? We were expecting shouting and swearing and throwing pans. And I was just like, that means I've done something wrong. If that's happening, we've done something really wrong. Yeah, I said, what you're seeing is a team that's well-trained. They know exactly what they've got to do. They enjoy doing what they're doing. And you're you're seeing the benefits of that. There's great foods coming out, and with, I get to smiles. spend time. Yeah, with smiles, and I yeah. get to I get to spend time talking to you about the food because I'm not literally putting out fires yeah. behind me uh, or trying to like stop fights. I, I've been there in the past. Don't get me wrong. I've been in between people like waving knives at each other and throwing pans, and yeah, and uh, yeah, that was good fun. Uh, well, t talk talk to me about that in terms of the way the the the, the way running the uh, the industry works because let's just work on the basis that you know whether a kitchen is is well ran or not not so well ran the pressure is there yeah always yeah. tell tell me about how uh working as a head chef or as a sous chef or anywhere in the kitchen what first of all what are the hours like um okay typical day um for us at luban and this is probably one of the better places i've worked in terms of our management um is starting at 10 a.m in the morning Obviously, there's places where you'll start at six if you're doing breakfast or, yeah, uh, earlier than 10 anyway. But we don't open for breakfast or lunch most times. So we'll be in at 10 and on a Saturday night, we're kind of leaving the building just after midnight. So it is a 14-hour day. Um, I've done hotels before where I've worked 18-hour days and that was that was brutal. You were doing 100-hour weeks every week over a, sustain, over a sustained period of time. But so, to, to pull that off... The must as well as I think we'll probably touch on some of the lows, but there must as well be huge highs, which are very motivating yeah. and, and and sort of a, you know, get get the old adrenaline pumping. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I don't think I would have done it ever if if I didn't get those highs and those. Um, yeah, I, I think I speak about that on social media quite a bit and saying this is how bad it can be, but the reason we do it is because of this and all the positives as well. Um, I never wanted to be a chef initially. I was training to be a, um, a designer, graphic designer and illustrator. But it was working in the kitchens and getting those highs and working with a team that really just pulled me in. So, um, yeah, they are there, 100%. And t talk to me then about a typical occasion where you do leave the kitchen on a high. What 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 do you do during those sort of sessions and, and how does it feel? Um, so it's... It's a Saturday, normally. It's the busiest day of the week. You've got hundreds of people booked in. You can see the list in front of you, and it's huge. <laughs> and there's, yeah, the sticky patches where you're getting kind of 30 people sitting down at once in the restaurant, and you're like, okay, this is going to be tough. But um, 
you just plow through it. Everything works. Everything is in sync. Every single member is is fired up, ready for it. Every every member of your staff is on the ball, and it all just goes to plan. Like every single person, like I said, is doing their role, is doing their job, and when that happens magic happens so yeah you'll fire it out all night and you get those last couple of checks out you're getting compliments from the restaurants you're getting everything's great on the plate you know you know that you've done everything right you know that that chicken was cooked perfectly you know those vegetables were absolutely pristine you know every element has gone right and it's just the end it's finished and then that's that, that you, that's you, leave, you leave buzzing and you're absolutely buzzing and you'll be it'll be hours you can't go to sleep. <laughs> You've probably no. drank too much caffeine throughout the day to get you through that, but your adrenaline takes you the rest of the way. Well, I was going to say that because, I mean, in a in a day of that length, and I wouldn't have thought you, like, get a lunch hour, do you? No, no, no. Not a lunch hour as such. Um, you just we, grab what you can, basically. Yeah, well, we make the effort at Luban to have staff dinner. Um, on a Saturday, that will be everyone grabs a few minutes at different times because we can't afford to have anyone missing from the floor sure. or from the restaurant well not many people so there's a time where two or three people might have gone just to go and have a, a quick bowl or something the other days there will be time for a good half an hour where front of house and kitchen all kind of come together meet around the pass and have have something to eat together and that's quite important that it's together um everyone's eating the same food everyone's eating at the same time it's that family feel yeah, again. It's, a, it's I mean? building that positivity like, okay, and that. You guys are busy. We're busy, but this is where we stop and we eat and we have a little natter. And it's not that bad, guys. It's okay. No, no absolutely. <laughs> Life's okay. So having having talked about the positives, what what are some of the causes of increased stress in in a kitchen? Um, a lot of it comes down to, I'd say, staffing. And um, there's there's so many times that right people will call in sick because people get sick. Um, but if someone calls in sick, you're short staffed. That means someone else is doing their Two job jobs. as well as their own. Um, and that in itself causes problems because you then don't ever want to call in sick. So there's this mentality in hospitality that you don't call in sick. You just don't do that. It's it's So you'll find there's people working while they are sick. And obviously you can't work to the best if, you've, if you're carrying like a heavy cold or a yeah, head flu or, or whatever else. So... And it became this, yeah, horrible. I'm mean, still there, really. Now that if someone's off sick, everyone's like, "Fucking hell!" Yeah, you know, yeah. Calling sick again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's twice in the last three years. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like it is like that because you remember it, uh, and that that does have to change. And that only comes from building a team that's big enough to to kind of yeah. Be- well, I was gonna I was gonna say that because I mean in in our business because I mean we. It doesn't have the same impact in in like a professional services or tech background when 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 you get people off. But the argument is always we'll build a little bit of contingency in the team. But yeah. then of course well, you've got to put your prices up because you've got more you've got yeah, more staff, overhead to yeah, carry. And you've got to keep yeah, and that is that is tight because yeah, the margins are so tight with restaurants. I mean, I think I don't think people quite realise how hard it is to make profit because of all the outgoings that are going, and you get people coming and going. Oh, it's a bit expensive in here, and it's like. You have no idea how no. much it costs us <laughs> and how much it costs us week on week to pay all the staff, pay the rents, pay the utilities. We're buying all these ingredients in. And don't forget the prices are rapidly increasing on all of our products. Um, same with alcohol. So, yeah, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a different story altogether. That's people who are used to cheap food from yeah. fast food outlets or from uh, supermarkets. And they don't really see the value in food in this country, which is really hard. Other countries, food is celebrated and it's like a good meal. You'll pay whatever it costs because it's a great meal. A lot of skill and time has gone into it. But in the UK, unfortunately, there's this, yeah, there's this, I don't know what it is, an undertone of why should we pay that for food? Do you know what I mean? It's it, like our human right. We should get food for free. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because you wonder whether that will have to change yeah. in, in so far as we've seen the, I always I'm, I've described this period post COVID as that we're entering the age of the employee. Yeah, because all of a sudden we got a situation where Brexit happened, uh-huh. where the world has sort of opened up during COVID. You've got there seems to be more job opportunities, remote opportunities, perhaps working for for foreign businesses, international businesses. So businesses are going to have to work harder yeah. to recruit and retain. Now it yeah. strikes me 
um, that if you if you're talking about the ones that the restaurants which are sort of the real budget eats, you know, your Weatherspoons type places, nothing against them, but you know the the, the food is of a certain price there. Yep. The staff are paid at a certain level, and you wonder if if all restaurants are having to fight harder for people. They're going to have to pay them more. They're going to have to look after them more, and they'd be obliged to put the prices up, which means. They're going to have to look at the quality of what they do. So you do wonder whether you're well placed here as a restaurant like Luban yeah. to really capitalise on that opportunity. Yeah, it's I've certainly since since COVID, like staffing recruiting has been the hardest it's ever been in the industry. Um, it, we were getting to a point before COVID where it was really difficult in terms of quality of staff um, because of how many restaurants and bars and pubs and everything there was. Um, it, I mean, it was just, it was an explosion of restaurants, really. I mean, look at Liverpool now. We've got thousands of restaurants. Wow. Where's the staff coming from, all of these? Um, yeah, and then COVID, obviously, it Brexit. And COVID took away all our European staff. They all went home and because of COVID. But now Brexit means it's harder for them to come back to work here. The students were all at home, and they're, they're a big part of the industry. So, yeah, it became really difficult. Uh, and we were just lucky in some respects. As I said, we did struggle front of house but we obviously carried on and we got there eventually and we got some great new guys in and kitchen i was really lucky with in terms of i managed to maintain everyone there um but yeah there has to be a change there has to be and again this is where my kind of leadership comes in it's like the way i run the kitchen and, and the front of house actually means that hopefully everyone wants to come to work they want to be here this is the place where people want to be working uh, we pay people well. We try and look after them as best we can. Uh, we've we've always maintained we're only a four day operation, which means staff have time to have a life as well, um, and that's that's one of the challenges of being a chef certainly that I've experienced over the years. Well, let's t talk to me about that in terms of your own experiences. I mean, first of all, being a doing doing what you do for so many years, it must be a physically demanding job yeah. because you spend so much time on your feet have you ever experienced any any issues due to that yeah yeah definitely probably more than most uh so i've done 23 years now how old am i now i'm 38 i think <laughs> i've forgotten it's when you get to long. when you get to our age it's just it's just another year isn't it so 15 i started in kitchens yeah so uh yeah let's say there's 23 years of working in, in hospitality um, and I've had two major operations on, on my left leg. <clears throat> uh, one relatively recently, kind of last six years or so. The one before that, probably about 12 years ago. And both times they basically said, what do you do for a living? And when I tell them, they're like, you have to stop. You have to stop doing that now. Otherwise, this problem will never go away. Which is so not really practical, is it? <laughs> so there's twice in my career that I've been told, stop, you can't do this anymore. You cannot be a chef anymore. And both times I've just been like... And I think about it for a few minutes and I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. I don't really have anything else that I do or I'm passionate about. I mean, I could probably have found some kind of office job, but would I have been happy doing that? Take kitchen life away from me, then I'd be a, a pretty sad man, I think. And um, what was it? Was it your leg, was it then? Yeah, what my was, legs, what was veins the issue? mainly. So ah, I've had right, veins okay. taken out twice now. Uh, so I'm running out of veins in one leg, oh, I think. Okay. No, I'll be all right. I'm okay. Um, but if anything, it kind of spurred me on to stay fit and healthy. So uh, I eat well now. Uh, I've got a personal trainer I've had for about six, seven years, Kerry, and she's been brilliant for me because without her, I wouldn't have found the time to go to the gym. I would have made excuses. I would have yeah. done. Um, I'm probably in the best shape of my life now. You look great, man. 38. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll come here again, I think. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's because I'm, yeah, I'm really conscious about, okay, work takes up this amount of space and this is the space i have to make sure i can keep working for as long as i can because yeah it's it's what puts the uh, roof over my head and that's it's what, what you love as well it's yeah. what i love doing yeah um so yeah i try and make lots of time for gym as much as i can um and eating healthy as well that's that's one thing that chefs do everyone yeah. always says oh do you cook amazing food for yourself and the answer is always no i have like beans on toast because yeah. i haven't got time do you know what yeah. I mean? although i do i do love when i'm at home with the family i'll always cook i enjoy cooking for my family um i love cooking so it's not a chore for me to do that at home 
it's a chore cleaning up after me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I have to clean the kitchen to afterwards. I'm like, oh, where's my KPs? Where's my kitchen <laughs> porters? I haven't got them at home, so I clean up. But um, no, it's really important you have a good, healthy diet when you're at home uh, and try and just try and eat. I think the main thing for me was, I mean, there's there's photos of me from years ago. There's a photo of a London Carriage Works, and I've got like my two rosette award, and I'm holding it in my hand, and I, I look I look like a crackhead. I do look like I'm a drug addict because of that skinny and right. and just wild this wild look in my eyes and it's just because i've been working 100 hour weeks um not been looking after myself um and that's really important you've got to you have to make time for it. i speak to a lot of chefs and like oh how would you fit it into you have you're obviously not working hard enough and stuff like that and i'm like no i work harder to make sure that i've got that time for me if i have to go to the gym at 1 a.m in the morning i'll go at 1 a.m in the morning if i have to go at 7 a.m before work i'll go at 7 a.m but it's a it's a dangerous culture isn't it where you've got people who think that if you've got a life you're not working hard enough and yeah. i mean if that it clearly isn't the case in your restaurant but if if that is the case in other restaurants, yeah. it that you must have seen the evidence of that mental pressure yeah, can huge. have on, can have on people. Have you got have you have you seen people who are really struggling? Yeah, all, all the time. Yeah, through my career, I've seen people yeah break down. I've had people crying in my arms before now. Do you know what I mean? This is like full grown men, like just just absolutely wiped out, nothing left to give. Do you know what I mean? And you're like bloody hell. I saw that from quite a young age as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I said I was I was running a kitchen at an early age and I saw older people than me and they were just completely wiped out mentally and physically just broken. And you're like, this is not right. This is this this can't continue. Chefs burning out and then just leaving the industry because they just can't do it anymore. They've got nothing left. And, and if like, you throw in if you throw in a nutterhead chef to that, it must be just unbearable. Yeah, I mean, some of the stories that you hear, certainly from like London and some of the like Michelin star restaurants, they're like they're depressing. They're like, wow, that's that is you go to prison for that. Like, do you know what I mean? Some of the stuff you hear about and it's it's starting to creep out now, which is good. Um, chefs are starting to get pulled for it like publicly on social media and it's just like right okay well you reap what you sow so this is Completely. a good thing as far as I'm concerned this is highlighting stuff and it's making them go shit I can't do that anymore I can't be like grabbing someone and battering them in a the fridge because that happens people get noses broken and pans like literally thrown at them and there's Michelin star chefs out there that like brand chefs with hot knives and you know what I mean yeah, it's just on. it's disgusting and it's like that that culture has has had to change for many years and I just feel like we're getting to a point now where we think it is um yeah you're getting pulled publicly on social media now for it if that happens the well, story's it's... coming out now people people aren't afraid anymore to say you did this to me in this year do you know what I mean and that is as far as I'm concerned that's brilliant well it's it's giving um that opportunity to whistle blow, isn't it? Yeah. And if if social media has one thing going for it, I mean, it's got lots of things going for it and lots of things against it, but the ability to give people a voice yeah. at scale and to hold um, people and businesses and leaders accountable for their actions, that's that's one of the real positives. Yeah, 100%. And if it, it's bringing about a big change across the industry that's needed to happen for a while. So yeah. I'm, I'm all for it. Um, yeah. So obviously you, you, you mentioned that, you know, the stress can be significant is are there any circumstances where it, it sort of seems overwhelming and too much to bear yeah 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 there's a there's a lot of it over the years there's there's many times i can probably like yeah i can pinpoint times in my career where you just you just don't want to do it anymore you're like why am i doing this and it can happen relatively frequently throughout your career you get those highs you got to think once when you're up high you can come crashing back down again with a horrendous trip advisor review, which you think's really unfair and really um and it and it yeah, it picks at you. I, I've tried not to ever really read TripAdvisor too much. I know we do well on TripAdvisor because I know what we have is a really good quality product and it's what we're trying to do. But not everyone gets that. And not everyone thinks the food that we're doing is Chinese because it's not what they're used to. So you can get some horrible remarks on there. And I don't know of any other industry where there's a forum where you can be picked apart so frequently and easily by like unnamed people because they all hide behind aliases none of them want to say i'm margaret from this place it's always m dot yeah. nine nine and it's like because they can hide and yeah and basically troll you from afar 
it's it's really hard and, and it's you, really depressing to read. Do you know what I mean? And have you have you ever seen people? Um, it's a bit of a um, depressing question, slightly. Have you ever seen anyone sort of turn to drink or drugs or anything like that? Yeah, it's notoriously bad for it because you got all those stresses. You got to think a chef's life. He will miss. I think I did a post about this the other day. If you go through all the big events of a yearly calendar, your chef is working all of them. So let's start with New Year. You're working. <laughs> You, every weekend you're working um and then you've got bank holidays you're working uh valentine's you're working mother's day father's day easter all of those times that you'd normally be spending with your family or with your friends a chef and certainly the rest of the restaurant team are actually all working because that's the time when we're busiest that's the time when people are going out to celebrate that's the time when we all need to be there making the money so you missed so much of normal life because of what you're putting in to the industry and trying to make a career and trying to make it good and you don't want to let the team down. All those things plus the hours. Um, and, and the hours are a big one. So you finish work at midnight. What are you going to do? Like You need this That's wind true. down time. So the obvious thing to do is go and have a drink because the bars are open. Um, so yeah, a lot of alcoholics in the business, he says, with a glass of gin at 11 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Uh, As for promotional purposes, yeah, though, that's 100% allowed. promotional, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I've been very careful not to go down that line personally. And I see, um, I mean, I've seen it, I've seen it all. I've seen drugs, um, drink, and that's seen is that after work? Violence, or? I've seen that's after, that's during, that's before, that's that's just mm, part dear. of it. Became synonymous with what a chef was, like you said, that stereotypical image. Why do you think you're so angry? Because he's probably an alcoholic or he's taking drugs or he's gonna be he needs drugs or, or whatever it is it kind of goes hand in hand um and even though you were able to to resist going down that road it still must mean that you've your your life your relationships have got to be structured differently than the majority how do you how do you handle that it's hard uh i, I reckon so many chefs kind of break up their relationships because the, the partner can't handle it can't handle you not being there can't handle you when they need you can't handle can't handle missing all those events that we just talked about birthdays weddings funerals you might not be able to get there do you know what i mean these are big big parts of family life and um and and chefs quite often aren't there so relationships are are tough and you need to find a partner who who gets it completely um and yeah, I've been there uh, plenty of broken relationships, mainly because I'm just not there. It's pointless, pointless having a chef as a boyfriend <laughs> so, <laughs> or a girlfriend because yeah. they're not there ninety percent of the time. So unless you're used to, yeah, unless you're happy with space on your own, you're not probably going to look. So those the, the level of commitment and also the highs must have to be very high to justify that level of life disruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's I don't know. I think it takes years of of maturing as well to suddenly realise, and it, or it might take a big something big happening in your family to suddenly say stop it gives you that perspective it. yeah it's not worth it so um and you have to kind of mature to that point it's the same with keeping yourself fit and healthy you also need to have a healthy life at home because there's nothing worse than having a really brutal week in work and going home and it's a really bad atmosphere there because oh, yeah. something isn't right well that's i mean that's interesting just just to, to touch on that because with a, a job where you're working more than half the day yeah in the restaurant, particularly if, like you said earlier, it could be six days a week. Yeah. Though life doesn't stop around you, does it? No, no, exactly. So any problems at home, money issues, uh, bereavements, stress, they're waiting for you yeah. when you walk out after a 14-hour shift. 100%, yeah. And a lot of the time, I said, I think we touched on it earlier, there's periods of your life where... Your life goes on hold. It literally goes on hold because you're so busy in work. And like, there's just bills racking up at home. And then, not that you don't have the money to pay, you just don't have the time to sit on the phone and pay them off. And then you get debt collectors letters, and then you get you get into all kinds of mess. And it's not because necessarily your finances are wrong, but you don't have the time to manage your finances. You don't have the time to manage family life. You don't have the time to look after yourself. 
and all this just builds and builds and builds. And that's why you see a lot of breakdowns, a lot of alcoholism, drugs, and then people ultimately either uh, leaving the profession or worse, they take their own lives. And there's, oh, a lot, there's a lot no. of it, and it's rife through the industry. So, well, it, I mean, you would, I mean, you, you're quite right in that case then, that this culture really does have to change. It because, needs a big, a yeah. big kick up the rear it needs to um yeah and hopefully we're getting to that point now and there's um yeah there is a nice side to it there is positives and if you can look after people and give them the time to have a life and give them a bit of support as well then then you'll get the most out of them i think and we'll yeah. start to see an industry where people want to be working in again and people that's that's a good that's a good career that's a good career i, I can go and work there you can go and start washing the dishes in a pub like I did at 15 and then be like traveling over to China to yeah. learn about a new cuisine and being on TV. It's it's there. Whatever you, you know, whatever you want from this career, it's there. And the industry just needs to embrace it. And the industry needs to be supporting it now and saying, yeah, we need more people coming in and, and carrying on and pushing forward. So, yeah. It does need a change. And hopefully we can be the change. Someone said to me, and it's an old saying, I think, it's be the change you want to see. And, and that's what I've tried to do in my career, 100%. Support people and talk about mental health and talk about the issues that people aren't really wanting to talk about. Well, it's good that there are leaders out there in the industry which to do that, and we need, we need more of them. Oh, 100%, yeah. Your career, um, you became a head chef at early 20s, 23, was it? 23, yeah, that's right. It was... Um, Possibly it was too soon for me, but uh, I still wanted to do it. And, and where was where was that? I was on Lark Lane at the time, 52 Lark Lane it was called. It's probably changed hands quite a few times, that that, that particular restaurant. Um, but yeah, I'd been, I'd, I'd been in a, a pub basically for from the age of 15 right the way through school, college, even university. I was traveling out to Wales for university and I was traveling back at weekends to work in the pub. And I kind of worked my way up the ladder in the pub until I was effectively running the restaurant um, at the age of, I don't know, 19, 20. I'd wow. run the restaurant for the head chef. He'd have his two days off, would be Saturdays and Sundays, which was the two busiest days. But because I came back at the weekends to work them and I'd worked there for so long, um, he'd take those two days off and work Monday to Friday. So looking back, that was a, that was a sort of a move that, <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. I came back and I'd run the restaurant then. And then I moved on to try and learn more. Um, I wanted to learn, yeah, fresh food and, and just increase my knowledge then. Um, so I went out to a little hotel out in my goal for a while and I was sous chef there. I learned a lot there. And then I came, where did I go then? I went to a uh, neighborhood in, Chilwall. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of back from my goal, back to Chilwall, where I've where I'm from there. I'm born and raised there, so um, that was a good move for me. Came back to the area, um, and I was working there for a while. And it was that was a really nice place to work. Um, learned a lot there, and then an opportunity came for me to work down Lark Lane. And I think I was kind of, yeah, like a, almost. I think I was a sous chef. I think <laughs> <laughs> I went to work under a good chef there. And he um, he left. He had an argument with the owner, and he left. And I was like, right, okay, well, I was like, I want it. I'm going to take it over. I think I can do this. And um, yeah, it was great. It was a great experience for me. I mean, I don't think I had a day off in nine months because I wanted it to work so badly. I pulled out, like, pulled everything into it. I, did, I applied, yeah, every energy I had went into this restaurant. Nine months. Yeah, it feels like nine months without a day off. Probably had one or two, maybe, but yeah, certainly didn't feel like it. I was in there all the time. And it was just, it was that drive that was spurring you on, or yeah. was it also this issue you touched on earlier of the highs were sort of <laughs> rewarding in as well as you you being very committed to developing your career? Yeah, I think at that stage, I'm trying to think of any highs I was having in that place. <laughs> um, no, it was a long time ago, but... Um, yeah, certainly a bit of both. It was, it was. I want to succeed. I want to do this. I want to work. I've always tried to work harder than everyone else around me. Uh, there's, there's, there's far better chefs than me out there. But in terms of work ethic, I was always like, I'll just work harder than everyone. Do you know what I mean? And show everyone what I can do. And I've always done that. And I think that's come from my, from my parents. They were really hard working people. So I'm like, right. I think I pulled that from them. Um, so I always set out to work harder than everyone else around me. Even in that 
pub kitchen when I was like 15, 16. I'd be saying to the chefs, oh, I can't remember this now, looking back now, someone reminded me this the other day, and I was like, yeah, you guys are going to be sweating in kitchens for years, I'll be off doing this, I'll be doing this, I'll be making all this money as an illustrator. Now look at me sweating. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think you're being modest there in terms of your, your, your quality, because you've, after you left Lark Lane, you've you've led some of the best restaurants in the northwest i mean i looked i looked down your cv and you've got hope street hotel london carriage works you've got yeah. i mean alba de cuba in liverpool that was a big deal at the point oh, you it was worked massive. There. yeah yeah it was huge it was the place to be it was and so then my next step from um i kind of burnt out a little bit at the, as, as head chef in lark lane i was exhausted i was probably like yeah the lightest i've ever been in my life um and again, we kind of uh, had a difference of opinion with the owner. It was like the direction I wanted to go in. And I said, I think this is a good time for me to say, I need to move on now. I need to find something else. And I'd been speaking to um, the exec chef of the Alma de Cuba group at the time, John. And he was like, come and work for us. He said, I'll put you into Alma de Cuba, go in as junior Sue. So you're taking a little bit of a step back. He said, but we're a big restaurant. We're busy. We're doing great food there. And I did. And it was a, yeah, that was a real again a great experience for me I stepped back the pressure came off me a little bit I had time to kind of settle into this role learn the role learn the restaurant and then I started moving back up the chain again so I went back up to sous chef um head chef eventually and then we opened some new restaurants and I was told right you want you to be the head chef of the noble house which oh, was I remember that yeah fantastic yeah restaurant. it was yeah mm. it was just I don't know for a couple of reasons, it just didn't quite work. But we were there for t I was there for two years as head chef, and we were doing great food, um, really good food. And we won some awards there as well. And then we opened up some more restaurants, and I was pulled out there and told to go into this operational role where I'd kind of run several kitchens. So they'd have head chefs in each one, and I'd be supervising them. And oh, again, that's interesting. So you were just moving, moving about and just yeah, check, checking, five, checking everything five going units well. at one point, and I'd kind of drop into each one, and yeah, um, and then at weekends I'd be based at Alma de Cuba. That was the flagship. That was the big yeah. one. So yeah, um, I'd go. Yeah, and that was an interesting role for me. But what I did feel, I felt, I missed being having my kitchen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, a little bit. So. Um, and then, yeah, for whatever reason, the restaurants went one by one. I was watching them go, right, we're going to sell that. That one's going, that one's closing. And I was just like, right, okay. I ended up back in Alma de Cuba again as the head chef there. And, um, yeah, I was there probably for another year and a half. I did seven years in total for that group. Um, and I learned an awful lot there under, um, yeah, two really good exec chefs, both called John, strangely enough. But um, I learned a lot there. And um, it was at that point I was like, right, I've done seven years here. What's my next move? And I was, I was looking around Liverpool and I was like, where else is there for me? I actually reached out to Paul Askew and I was like, Paul, what, what do I do next? That's London, he was at yeah, London Carriage Works. He was at London it? Carriage yeah. Works, Hope Street Hotel. Um, and I was like, what, what do I do? I went to Paul for advice as the kind of... Um, He's what I see as like the OG in Liverpool. Like, do you know what I mean? Paul's been here for, for many years and he's been a fantastic advocate for food in the city. And so I reached out to Paul and said, what, what do I do next? Where do I go? And he, it was just perfect timing. Because <clears throat> he was about to open his own restaurant, the art school, or certainly had plans too. So he was looking for someone to replace him at the uh, London Carriage Works. And he said, why don't you come in and interview for this? And I was like, brilliant. Okay. And that's where you, you won your two, is it rosettes? Yeah, so Paul had had two rosettes at the Carriage Works for, for a couple of years. Um, so it was huge for me to go into a two rosette kitchen. And then it was down to me to maintain those two rosettes. And so, what, tell me, what, what, why is a rosette, in what circumstances are they awarded? So someone will come in um, and you will be judged on everything, service, um, the restaurant, food, quality, style, um, seasonality. You've got to be picking the right ingredients for your menus. The menu has to flow correctly. There's quite a big criteria for it. So, and as you see, there's not many rosetted restaurants in Liverpool. And at the time, I think there was only, well, there was only, yeah, London Carriage Works with two. I think we had one at, 60 hope street um and that was it um so it was big deal for me suddenly i had massive shoes to fill 
And there's always that there's always that niggling feeling in your back of your mind is are you ready? Are you a two rosette chef? Or can can you do this? And that was something that would ultimately drive me on and I would work a million hours a week to make sure I was good enough and I was pushing that. And yeah, we 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 kept those rosettes and you win them every year. So every year you you are judged secretly. Someone comes in, you don't know. That's amazing. Until they yeah, until you get pulled out into the restaurant. Have you ever got oh so you do know at the end, do yeah. you right? Yeah. I see. After you've after they've finished their meal. And I'll normally go through everything. So yeah, they'll have done um yeah, they'll have come in, experienced the welcome, had a look around the restaurant, sat at the bar and had drinks. It's it's everything. So <laughs> And then you get to sit down outside and they're like, hello, my name is Julie from the AA. And you're like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And do they, do they tell you like that you've, yeah. you've got it then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There and then. And that's then, amazing. And then it's, a, it's, such, it's such a feeling. There's been the first time that I'd got mine because it was the first time that, yeah, Paul had moved away. So my first assessment and I went and cried in a room because I was just like that overwhelmed well, it's I, all I, I did it. I, it's I that commitment it. and yeah. that work rate and the hours you've had to put in and the dedication that yeah. when that recognition comes in, it must be, it must be an emotional it's, moment. It's huge, yeah. And then, like the kind of like you said, those highs following that. There's just nothing like that. Do you know what I mean? That adrenaline, that, those highs. I mean, yeah. People talk about Michelin star, and that's a that's a huge accomplishment to get a Michelin star. Uh, maybe one day. Certainly haven't ruled it out. But, sure. Um, um, but I, I can only imagine the the highs you would get from a Michelin star. But then also on the back of that, losing a Michelin star must be the worst yeah, feeling in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And same as if we'd lost rosettes. Um, I knew the whole time I was at London Carriage Works for four years in the back of my mind was, I cannot lose a rosette. I cannot lose these awards. And that was driving you on? It does drive you on, yeah. It also, yeah, I mean, it's mentally it's, it's, it's tough knowing that at any moment... So that food that you're sending out, if you're if you're not hundred percent happy with it, that could be going to an AA inspector. Do you know what I mean? Of course, or someone and, from Michelin. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. Uh, and at that point, after London Carriage Works, you 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 were you were recruited by the is it, there's a group, isn't it, which own own Australasia and Artisan in in Manchester. Yeah, Living Ventures. That of um, course, yeah. I'd done four years at the Carriage Works and Hope Street Hotel, and I just felt that that was. There was nothing else in Liverpool I could move on to. Um, I kind of hit a, a wage ceiling. I knew I wasn't going to get paid any more than I was on in the city. Um, it was a good wage, and I thought, yeah, um, but I want to push forward. I always want to go next step. Everyone wants to be earning more money and doing better. That's that's success, isn't it? It that's, is indeed, that's, yeah. That's constantly pushing, pushing, pushing. And I was like, where do I go after London Carriage Works? Like, there isn't anywhere in the city that's better than a London Carriage Works, certainly at that time. Um, I was like, there's nowhere more prestigious or that's the jewel in the crown for me. Um, so I was like, right, I'm going to see what else is out there. And yeah, I headed out to Manchester. I uh, spoke Could to the guys at Living Ventures. I'd, I'd known a lot of them over the years. I've, I've, yeah, I've worked with a lot of these guys. Uh, so I knew them all as well. And yeah, I went out to work in uh, as an operations chef, which was basically, again, that role where you don't have a kitchen, you kind of, floating around two or three kitchens ensuring that the head chef's doing their jobs. Because they, they are some huge restaurants. I've, been, I've not eaten in Australasia, but I've eaten Artisan. Yeah. And I mean, that was a big restaurant, but I think was, I think Australasia was probably even bigger, wasn't it? Artisan was the biggest in oh, was terms it? of physical space and people sitting down at any one time. Australasia was just an absolute beast of a restaurant yeah. in terms of how busy it was. So... And they were both massive learning curves for me. So I started an artisan at the time, like Australasia was their flagship. Uh, so I had an eye on Australasia. I was like, that's where I want to be going. But they were like, right, okay, cut your teeth on artisan first. And we went there and we kind of, um, I was addressing the problems there really. It was like, right, okay, it's a big staff that we need. We've got high turnover of staff. Um, no one enjoys working here. Like it's, it's, it's a tough place to work. So I was like, right, okay. He said the food quality needs to come up, but at the same time, you can have, I think something ridiculous, you can have like 250 people sat at any one time in that restaurant, do you know what I mean? Is that on like a Saturday night or on something? Saturday night, yeah. And he said, you'll do like 400, 500, 600 people on a Saturday. Um, and I'm like, right, okay, this is a big restaurant. <laughs> yeah. 
You can have tables of 40 sitting down at once, but you can have two tables of 40 sitting down at once. That's how big it is, yeah. So I was like, right, okay. So, yeah, we put a lot in. We changed the menus. We made them, like, quicker and easier for the kitchen staff to deliver, but really good quality stuff as well. Great produce, uh, really fun and exciting as well. And then we kind of built this attitude. It was the attitude I needed to work on and get the staff, like, working with each other and for each other and building a good team, and we did. And then um, moved into Australasia. And that's where my kind of start and my education of Asian food came in. They were doing some... Australasia's always been a great restaurant. Yeah. Um, great menus, great quality ingredients, and really interesting ingredients as well. So it was nice for me to be like, oh, wow, there's a whole new kind of like plethora um, of ingredients that I've not used before here. So uh, we do... Australasia was a big sushi restaurant, big sushi, um, small plates, um, loads of fresh fish and... Really nice kind of, yeah, uh, robata skewers and stuff like that. So it was really cool. Very Japanese, I'd say, was the main yeah. influence. But then kind of Pacific Rim as well. So a little bit of fusion there. but And that was fantastic. And then I said to them, I said, I, I just want to be at Australasia. I want to, like, give me, I don't know, whatever title it is, exec chef of Australasia because I love this. I love the concept. And it's really busy. Strangely enough, always full of scousers. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's Saturday night, I'll be walking around the restaurant, be like, oh, scousers, scousers, scousers. <laughs> love, love our sushi, you see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and when did when did Lou when did when did Lou Man pop, pop up there? Okay, so I'd done two years at Australasia then. Uh, and again, I wasn't getting like itchy feet as such, but I was kind of like, right, what's next? I want to see what's next. Uh, and I was travelling to Manchester every day. Oh, it's heavy. I was doing, and again, I was doing serious hours at Australasia, big hours there, and the travel on top meant that I was, yeah. Sometimes I'd set off at six in the morning to beat the morning traffic into Manchester. If anyone has done that trip, you know have, how brutal it is. Yeah, You've terrible. got to get there before a certain time, otherwise you're just stuck in traffic for like an hour. Yeah. So I'd set off at like 6 a.m., and then I'd be getting back home kind of half one, two o'clock in the morning because, yeah, you'd finish late and then it's a 45-minute drive with nothing on the road, do you know what I mean? So it was like, yeah. Uh, so and that was, you do that a few times a week and be like, Phew. Yeah, it's, tired. it's not sustainable in the long term. No, term, yeah. And there was a couple of times that I thought, I think I fell asleep when I was driving home then or at least just had a moment where... Yeah. It's not good. It's really dangerous. Yeah. So I was like, so what was the what, what was the attraction of Luban? Because while she had that experience of Asian food in in Australasia, yeah. I mean Luban's a, a different sort of level, isn't it? A different. Yeah. I mean Luban is a hundred percent authentic Chinese food. It's not yeah. fusion. It's not Asian. It's Chinese. And so I got the phone call saying, "Hi, would you be interested in this role? We're opening a Chinese restaurant in Liverpool." And I was just like, "Why are you calling me?" Do you know what I mean? I literally the first thing I said was, "Why, why are you calling me?" Um, a Chinese restaurant. I said, I've done no Chinese food ever. I like Chinese food. Sure. <laughs> it's my go-to takeaway. But uh, um, And they were like, no, this is a bit different. Um, it's a real big project. It's a collaboration with China, with a college out in China, and with a big food group, like this multi-billion pound food group out in China, the Changjin Food Group. They're going to sponsor it. So it's £2 million pound investment from them. They're going to build the restaurants and we want to build this kind of academy there where we're training people in Chinese culinary arts and we want to fly you out to China. And I was like, sorry, you just say that again. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to fly me out to China? So I said, oh, so what you're telling me is I get to move back to Liverpool. So that, tra that travel's gone. You're going to pay me more than I'm currently on in Manchester because I thought I'd hit this ceiling in Liverpool. But they were like, no, no, we can, this is the wage. And I was like, bloody hell. I was like, I get to travel to China. Because um, you always hear in this industry, it's like, right, we'll take you out to this place. We'll take you there. It never happens. Is it never, not? no, never. Even with like Australasia, it was like, yeah, we should go to Japan. We'll do a trip out to Japan. Yeah, no, no chance. It costs a lot of money for a start. And then it's like, okay. But these guys are like, no, before we open, you have to go to China. You have to. It's the only way you're going to see like what we're talking about, the style of food and, and everything. You have to get that. And it's, we want to, we want the culture of the food to be evident in the menu. We want the stories there. And I was like, okay. I was just like, just sign me up now. Like, yeah. it sounds incredible. Um, and tell me then, because uh, uh, this is the part of the story which really fascinates me. You you did go to China and you became the final apprentice for a guy called Master Wu. Yeah. yeah. So tell me, who is Master Wu and, just... and, and, and what, what does being his, his apprentice entail? Yeah, so this is probably... 
the proudest moments of my career. This is probably the pinnacle. So um, I went out there and I went to um, the college in Tianjin. And Tianjin's just, it's, it's the closest city to Beijing. Um, it's not the most famous city by any stretch of the imagination, but it is renowned for really good food. Um, and the college there is obviously then renowned for producing some of the best chefs, certainly in northern China. And they'll go from Tianjin and out and across wherever, Beijing and then, yeah, all across the country. But the guy who runs the college, as in the head chef of the college, is Master Wu. And he's trained thousands upon thousands of chefs over the years. He's probably like 50 years into his career now. Um, and he's he's like a rock star out there in Tianjin, which I, yeah, as soon as we went out for something to eat and everyone was just flocking to him, like, um, yeah, it was like, this is this guy's serious. Like, like, everyone knows him. You're in this city of like 15 million people and everyone mm -hmm. knows Master Wu. <clears throat> because the, the the chefs are treated as such, like really high regarded for what they do. Well, it's what it's the point you were making earlier, wasn't it, about the way food is regarded in different countries? Yes, yeah, yeah, and, Ch and, and food in Chinese culture is huge. It's like it's massive, and um, it's really nice to see that over there. So the chefs are treated like rock stars, and and Master Wu is like really high regarded. He's like one of the top level chefs in the entirety of China. So China as a nation recognizes Master Wu as like one of the very best. And um, yeah, and he was like my host for the entire time I was there. Uh, so we went to the college and um, there was demonstrations from the master chefs who were there at the college. And it's really interesting because they all specialize in their own kind of thing. So there's a, a master chef of cold dishes and a master chef of hot dishes, and a master chef of uh, dough modeling, which is mad. The stuff they can make, really intricate. Uh, and then yeah there's like master chef of like dumplings and pastry and things like that so and then obviously master Wu sits above all of them uh, and he's the one that's yeah got them up to master chef level of all of their disciplines and is that is that the the sort of um title or the status you're looking to attain when you're his apprentice that you, yeah. you attain master chef you, yeah you're going to work your way up until you reach master chef status and that's when you know yeah and you is that something you've achieved yet or is that something no i'm still i'm still apprentice at the moment and it'll take a few years for yeah. me to reach that but uh did covid I, get in the way then yeah massively that's, yeah, that's really put a dent in it that's probably put us a year well a year and a half behind schedule but um i was meant to go back out to china every six months and i'll spend time oh, with master oh, wu okay. again and we'll do some like one-on-one -on -one training and he was to come over to, to Liverpool and that will all happen it's just yeah, push, back, push back push back now um, and what sort of skills did you bring after your first <clears throat> visit to China what sort of skills did you bring back with you that perhaps you didn't have before you, you left I think it was more the understanding of what Chinese food is about it was that light bulb moment of holy crap this is this is what chinese food is not what we've been eating for the last like however many years yeah. totally different hunt like it couldn't have been any different it was just worlds apart uh, i was getting like everything was super healthy over there really fresh emphasis on fresh local seasonal produce and doing very little with the produce so it's really quickly cooked so you're getting all the nutrients out of it or yeah. um yeah it, you don't mess around with it too much it has its own great flavor so why are you masking it with all these sauces and stuff and it was just that yeah that moment and it was just like this is what chinese food should be what we've been eating over here is just nothing like it well so. i've got to say that comes across when you eat at luban because if if anyone listening or watching has a perception of of what a Chinese restaurant is, and obviously no disrespect to more more conventional British Chinese restaurants, if you know what I mean, but Luban is a very different experience. The food is very different. Yes, yeah, yeah. Than, yeah. than, than you will. Get. The, the the menu looks very different than I've ever seen in a Chinese restaurant. So that's is that realization the light bulb moment of what chinese food was is that something you brought back and have implemented oh, 100 and that's that was what i took away from that first visit to china was 100 percent what it was you need to see what it is and that's what was got told to me when i first took the job you need to go and see it and so bringing that back more than kind of skills immediately uh obviously i got to see a lot of yeah uh, amazing knife work and cooking processes but it was the this is what Chinese food is. This is what it's all about. Everything is very healthy. It's all about, this is all good for my body because, do you know yeah. what I mean? The light years ahead of where we are in terms of a country about our food, light years ahead, you know, 
calorie content, you know, what it's good for, what part of the body this ingredient's good for, and they link it to their Chinese medicine as well. So it's it goes hand in hand with this massive well-being and, and health over there. And you get to see that for the Chinese people I was meeting that looked younger than me and were like 100 years old. Like, bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> They're leaping around with a spring in the step and I'm just like, bloody hell, the back's going yeah. here. Do you know it's what I mean? All, it's all our fresh fish and that sort of thing, uh, isn't so it? So much fresh vegetables. Uh, yeah, vegetables, huge, loads of green veg. Um, yeah, fresh fish. Certainly in this region of China, you're, you're a port city in Changjin. Very similar to Liverpool, strangely enough. But... Um, Whereas we don't eat a lot of seafood in Liverpool. <coughs> I find it's dead weird. It's dead yeah, hard it's to true. sell fish in Liverpool. Like, right? There's only certain fish that people will eat in Liverpool, like right. scousers will eat. Right. They'll be like sea bass, salmon, scallops. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And over, over in China, obviously eating absolutely everything there is to eat. Um, they'll eat, yeah. And, and it's a great philosophy. They will, they will eat everything on the animal as well. There's no waste. There's no waste whatsoever. It's like, well, why are you wasting such a beautiful ingredient? Wow, you know what yeah. I mean? So, um, and what's the what's the next steps then in order, to, in order for you to achieve this master chef status? So it's carry on at the moment. We'll be doing like remote learning, which is quite difficult. Um, I'll get set tasks to do, and I'll be working on them and cooking these dishes. Um, so the next step, I need to get back out to China again. Uh, Master Wu will be coming over to Liverpool as well, which will be great because we'll, we get to do a really cool um, kind of master and apprentice night at Luban, which will be amazing. And we, I don't suppose you've got a day for that yet. Have Not you? yet, no. We're waiting for everything to put. We'll probably do, I mean, he's here for a few weeks. So we'll probably do a full week. We'll do a set menu for a full week. Wow. And you'll be getting to taste the food from one of the top chefs in China, do you know what I mean? Which, amazing. I mean, who would get the opportunity to do that normally? And he's coming to Liverpool, which is just massive for the city as well. The ties we've had with China over over hundreds of years have been great. But there is, now, isn't there? There is, a, there is a, a big Chinese community in Liverpool. Yeah. And they are are very much uh, very integrated and very much part of our own history I would yeah, say well, yeah it's huge and they've become part of Liverpool food scene massively Correct. so I mean a chippy in Liverpool is is Chinese Yes. Anywhere outside of Liverpool. And it's you're your like, fish and chips. What is, where, where's the rest of it? It's yeah. just fish and chips and sausage. You know uh, what I mean? And I find it really funny. Like, yeah, uh, students who go away uh, from the city and they're like, I can't find salt and pepper chicken anywhere. I can't find it. I can't find this. You go to Chippy and there's just nothing there. No. And I'm like, that's because the Chinese have been such a massive part of our upbringing. Uh, like Shu Mai's as well. Obviously, Scousers love Shu Mai's, but... You can't find them, in, even in Manchester. It's only down, like, half, half an hour down the road. No one knows where the Shumai is. No. Do you know what I mean? It's like, this is mad. Um, when, it, when, when COVID hit, yeah. um, what was that like in terms of um, you're a busy restaurant, you're undertaking this, um, this fantastic course to achieve this status. Uh, everything is going uh, really, really well. How did it feel to sort of have the rug pulled from under you? First, first of all, personally, yeah, um, it was it was horrifying. Uh, I I was I was I remember being in tears, but mainly, and that was mainly to do with the staff. We didn't know what was going to happen with the staff. This is before like any kind of support packages being talked about, and I was literally telling the staff, "You guys have to go home now," and I don't know what's going to happen because they they pulled the Boris came out, didn't he, and sort of said. You shouldn't be going to restaurants, yeah, yeah. but without kind of any sort of explanation about yeah. what the crack was. Yeah, and it was horrible. As a Chinese restaurant, we were on the first affected in terms of Chinatown became a ghost town, didn't it? Mm. Um, and that was really sad to see. And I was kind of saying, this, these people are part of our culture. These are scousers, do you know what I mean? And you're saying, we're not going near Chinatown. And it was really sad for me to see that. Um and then as a Chinese restaurant, people obviously stopped coming to us. And we were like, yeah, I think I did it. I think I did um it was either the Echo. I think I did an Echo article. And I was like, guys, you can't catch COVID from a spring roll. It's not Chinese food. It's going to get you sick. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, and also we're all like scousers. Yeah. Like, we, there's no, we don't have Chinese staff working here, but you're all still staying away from us. Yeah, it was devastating because like I said, I was just getting ahead of steam. I was just getting into that role and yeah kind of realizing everything that i'd seen in china was now in the restaurants and the restaurant beautiful restaurants 
Um, and we were just starting to get kind of a name for ourselves those first three months. Yeah. And then, like you said, it literally got pulled. But you didn't you didn't sort of uh, sit around during lockdown for oh, two no, reasons. No, no. First of all, the great British menu. Uh, I really enjoyed seeing you on that. How did that all come about and, and did you enjoy it? Yeah. Um, that's, um, that's a big box ticked for me. That was, as a chef... Growing up, you watch like Master Chef and Great British Menu. That's what you watch. Do you know what I mean? And for me, I always liked Great British Menu the best because it was you put your menu out. It's it's your choice. You do what you want to do, and you're showcasing that. And um, I suppose the last few years, I, I kind of hadn't really had time for much television, so I hadn't really watched it. I shouldn't say that. Sorry, GBM. Um, <laughs> I've started watching again now. <laughs> <clears throat> it was kind of one of them. It was one of those dreams that I had years ago. I want to, I'm going to get on that show, and then that kind of like yeah disappeared into the back of my brain, for example. Um, and it it became less important for me to be on that show. For me, it was more about let's get this restaurant open. Let's get yeah a busy restaurant. Let's let's learn and let's let's become a profitable business. That kind of stuff takes over. Then as an older chef. Um, that's the priority then. It's a profitable business rather than, yeah. But did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy the experience? I absolutely loved it, yeah. I think that comes across on camera that like... It does. You haven't everyone fun. was yeah. so stressed and it is stressful. It's so stressful. It really is. But at the same time, I kind of told myself, just go and have fun. Go and enjoy yourself. Like try and make the most out of it. And um, yeah, I think that comes across really well. So, I mean, at the time it was really difficult. Like you said, I didn't stop through lockdown. I was working probably more than I've ever worked before. Well, let's 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 just touch on that because as well as uh, your TV appearance, you 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 also have been recognised as one of lockdown's entrepreneurs. Yeah, and that was because you you founded and implemented. Um, the Liverpool Independent Delivery Service, and that was recognised by Plusnet. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, this? that's right. Yeah, yeah. So tell us all about Lids then, and and, and what, what, where did it come from, the and Lids, yeah, and why did you decide to do it, and 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 how did you end up really making this valuable contribution that was recognised? Uh, so the first, it was literally the first week where we'd been told, right, we're locked down, we're closed, and we'd sent, we'd emptied all the fridges and freezers because it was like we don't know when we're reopening <clears throat> it's pointless as holding food in the in the fridges definitely but certainly even in the freezers what's the point of holding stuff in the freezers for like six months yeah true it was like it's gonna be horrible so um but we were like let's take it out to people that need it so first and foremost we made these little bundles for all the staff and i was like we have no idea what's happening with you i'm sorry for that i'm sorry for that i don't know what's gonna happen i'd kind of try to tell them everything was going to be all right and would look after them but we had no idea what was happening so anyway we gave everyone this big like box of food and sent them on the way and then some of the staff are still kicking around and we were like let's go and drop all this stuff off to food banks and to the homeless shelters because we had a lot of meat and stuff and it was like someone can use this sure so we drive around the city dropping all that stuff off and there was we worked with Whitechapel and Paper Cup Project and we were delivering stuff to them and even stuff like sanitising, hand gels and stuff we were delivering out across to whoever needed it. Um, yeah, and obviously Food Bank we did quite a lot with as well um, and then that was it, kind of shut the restaurant, closed it all off, went home. And I'm not, I'm just that person who after like a few minutes, I'm like, right, bored. Like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I can't sit down for long. Um, I need to be doing, actively doing something. And um, and then it was like, right, okay, well, who else can we help? Do you know what I mean? Um, so it wasn't just that you were, you, you were sort of thinking business at that point. I mean, it, it was, it was very that came much. secondary. Yeah, that came secondary, the business part of things. First and foremost, I was like, we need to help people. We need to get food to people that can't get it. Because everyone was struggling with those supermarket slots and everything, weren't they? Yeah, well, supermarkets weren't ready for it at all. Even though they could see it happening across Europe, they just didn't react in time. Um, so the, the shelves were empty and you were getting these horrible scenes, these images of like old people getting to like shelves and they're all bare because everyone's grabbed everything and ran. Do you know what I mean? It was stockpiling. It was stupid, wasn't it? Um, yeah. And it probably would have been enough if everyone didn't panic. That's but, right. But yeah. as it was, <clears throat> supermarket shelves were empty. There was no delivery slots available to people. And I'd been speaking to like the guys who deliver my veg, for example, or my meat on the fish and they were like what do we do all our trades just gone like in a second because it wasn't just restaurants you gotta imagine like yeah fruit and veg companies butchers fishmongers all of those suddenly had had no business no or certainly reduced business massively reduced like overnight 
Um, so I was speaking to them all, and I was like, we need to, we need to deliver to people who are struggling. So people were, I put, I think I've just put a Facebook post out saying, I know the situation we're in at the moment. I say, I have access to all these local suppliers. If anyone needs anything, just let me know and I'll organise it. And then put my phone number on. That was that was interesting. So when did, yeah. <laughs> when did you when did you first get noticed then that you'd 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 captured the attention in terms of being recognised for this entrepreneurship during lockdown? Oh, okay. So we, we ran Lids successfully for I mean a year and a half. It was busy, it was booming. Um like the as I said, I put my phone out on this Facebook post and I was getting calls from like um nursing homes and, and places like that who were really struggling. And I, I was literally on the phone probably eight, nine hours a day for seven days a week, like taking orders and then phoning my guys, my like butcher, my veg guy. And I was like, this is too much. And I was like, I'm struggling with this. So then um, we created the website and we made it more of a online supermarket. So you could choose, I spoke to all the suppliers, put your packages on here. People will choose a package. We'll deliver it out. So yeah, I then managed to employ four drivers we bought a refrigerated van. Four drivers were on the road um, at any one time. We were that busy, and that ran, and it was it was crazy, yeah. Um, and it was really busy, and and the businesses were doing well from it, and um, yeah. And then, I mean, it's only relatively recently as things started going back to normal again. Um, yeah, PlusNet got in touch, and we're like, we're recognizing entrepreneurs who who did something. Special and that did that just come out the blue, yeah, didn't it? Completely out the blue. Um. Plus now, obviously, it's an international company. Yeah. I said, like, okay, this is this is quite nice. He said, there's there's ten awards we're giving across the country, and you're one of them. And I said, like, that's great, thank you. Uh-huh. And of course, you've just been recognised as well, haven't you? More locally, in terms of yeah. the what is it, the Liverpool Business Awards? Yeah, downtown? So it was downtown in business, and I was nominated for a Business Hero of the Year 2021 because of the work we'd done with Lids and with business, and then also the kind of charity work that came off the back of that. Um, and before that, we were effectively just doing things out of the goodness of our own hearts to begin with. Um, once we realised there was a business model in there that would um, generate a little bit of revenue, because what we were making on the sales, I wasn't interested in making money from it. Um, once I knew that I was being furloughed and all my staff were looked after, it then just became about community. So the money that was coming in and we were making in profit on lids went back into the communities. We would... We were donating that money back into our community side of things. So we were we were delivering um, fresh fruit and veg boxes with bread and occasionally meat in there to families that were struggling. And we we looked after probably a hundred families right the way through lockdown with this box that would turn up. So once a week we'd go with a big fresh fruit and veg box and recipes in there and stuff because the food banks are great and they keep people alive. Um, but in terms of nutritional, sure. good yeah. value foods, mm. it's just it's very difficult for them to to, to deliver that. Yeah, isn't massively. It? So, and we are seeing improvements. There's now like um, the the food banks moved into this kind of like um, social supermarket model now, and there's a lot more fresh fruit and veg involved now. So that's be- definitely better. But at the time, we were like, we need to get nutrients into people, and but show people how to cook as well. It's like, don't just give them a meal. Show them, give them the ingredients and the recipe card. They can make that meal again now, over and over and over. So that's that's where my brain was. It was like, we need more food education out there. Let them cook for themselves. Let people learn skills. Um, so that's what we did with that. And then, like I said, we did packed lunches for, God knows how many thousands of packed lunches we did over over the space of a year to kids who we thought were struggling. Well, um, I mean, you, you, you've you earned those awards, man. And yeah. I mean, fair play to Plusnet and fair play to Downtown. Yeah, da- I was really, da- really honoured to receive that one locally because it meant that, okay, uh, as a city, I've been recognised. And I love I love Liverpool. I'll always bang on about it. You saw that on Great British Menu. It was like, you're, you're showcasing the North West. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> I'm showcasing Liverpool. And I, all my like yeah, dishes were all aimed about Liverpool. So, But it's great It's great that downtown as well, who I, I do know, they, they do tend to look beyond just... Uh, you know who are the most profitable businesses, yeah. and, and and I mean they they do recognise that sort of success as well. But to recognise that um, sort of philanthropy that you showed and that yeah. commitment to charity, I think is a huge credit to you and a yeah. credit to them it really, as well. It really meant a lot, so I'll, I'll be really grateful for it as well. So and it was a fantastic evening as well. Don't get yeah, me wrong, yeah. I bet. there was a few drinks. Not <laughs> <lie>. not <laughs> <gonna lie. laughs> 
listen, I'm so, so grateful to you for coming on, Dave. Tell, tell me, um, we're here now. Uh, you've talked to us through your uh, unbelievable uh, last few years. Yeah. If we met again in a few years' time, what stories will you have to tell us then? What's your, what's your plan? Um, right, we've got some great stuff in the pipeline at the moment. Uh, I've just been asked to do a weekly column, food and drink, for, about Liverpool and what's going on in the city, which is great. That's going to be with the guide, Liverpool. Um, I'm in talks with someone to do my own podcast, actually, with another chef in the city. We want to call it Too Many Cooks. And um, and it's just going to be dead fun, lighthearted, talking about food and drink. Because as a city, I just don't think we talk about it enough and what's going on in the city and, and how good this city can actually be at food and drink and hospitality. Um, hopefully, some more TV coming. Well, there is some more TV coming, That's but I great. can't tell you what it no, is. Fair enough. <laughs> I've just recently filmed something, and that'll probably be out next year. Um, and that's something I'd love to do a lot more of. I, I like. I just I'd love being on camera and, and being passionate and talking about like what I love doing about hospitality, about food, about drink. Um, so yeah, hopefully a bit more TV. Um, I love to say there's a there's a, a cookbook kind of bubbling at the moment so i want to showcase what i kind of saw in china and showcase the real chinese culinary arts that i saw um and and hopefully that will enable people to recreate those dishes at home and kind of change the mindset of oh, okay it's not all msg salt sugar gloopy sauces it's not what it's about at all so well do you know what i mean i, I made the point earlier on that one of the reasons i'm i'm so grateful to you for coming on is because you you didn't strike me at all as your stereotype restaurant leader and you've absolutely confirmed that today dave because it's not just i mean i can attest to the quality of your restaurant not just the quality of the food but the way it is ran and the way the team are clearly supported and valued yeah 100%, but as yeah. well the 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 way in which you you've got these different um di, di, you've got your finger in in many pies and yeah. also you're di diversifying your skill base the way you have and you're succeeding in everything you're turning your hand to I mean that's what this podcast all about. It's all about success and success through struggle. And you've 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 gone through that part of your career as well. It's been an absolute joy talking to you. We're going to have the links to your gin on our uh, our website and our socials, which I very much enjoyed. Yeah, that's good. We're going to have the links to Luban also on on our socials. I would recommend both of them to all of our audience. But in the meantime, thank you very much, Mr. Dave Critchley. Thank you very much. Yeah.